The research was conducted in the second half of 2010. And uh, as you said, we looked at five markets. And in yeah. choosing those five markets, we were trying to get a sort of representative sample, as best you could, of West Africa. So mm -hmm. we ranged from, if you like, DRC at one end of the scale, yeah. uh, what might be considered a pre-transition yeah. stage, right through to Nigeria at the other end of the scale. Um, and the methodology was to speak to the CEOs mm -hmm. of the uh, major banks in each of those markets. So mm -hmm. overall, we spoke to 28 CEOs. Um, scattered across each of those five countries. And the general view coming out of the, the, the uh, leadership? Quite, uh, well, similar similarities coming across, like the move towards greater mobile banking, mm -hmm. but obviously depending on the stage of economic development, if you take DRC, there are obviously uh, quite different opportunities going forward in DRC relative to uh, Ghana, to Nigeria, or even to Cote d'Ivoire. Let's talk about the country specifically. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Nigeria has had its own interesting last 18 months, yes. two years, and that's reforms by the CBN, mm -hmm. um, bailouts of banks, and now mopping up toxic assets by an asset management uh, company. Just in terms of what's happened in Nigeria, mm -hmm. how do they view the environment going forward by way of banks' assets and liabilities and just their ability to operate? Okay, well, I think the, the new governor, Governor Sanusi, would hope that, um, that, that the worst of times are behind them now. As you said, they've created an asset management agency, I mean, AMCOM. Um, it's hard to think that just in 2005, there were 89 different banks yeah. in Nigeria. Today, there are 24. Uh, about eight of those were considered troubled or rescued mm -hmm. banks. But um, I think going forward, we expect further consolidation, and perhaps that's an opportunity for some of the foreign banks. Some foreign banks right. are in Nigeria at the moment, as you know, Standard Bank and Standard Chartered, Citibank has been there a long time. But perhaps some other f foreign banks, HSBC would be yeah. an example, might see this as an opportunity to move into the Nigerian market. Well, obviously, we are going to see consolidation because the deadline is looming for announcements mm -hmm. on mergers and acquisitions of some mm -hmm. of the rescued banks. But um, as an outsider looking mm -hmm. in, were there moments of caution as you looked at the Nigerian environment just by way of maybe the valuations of some of these banks, the, the returns if you're investing in these banks? Yeah, I think, um, again, Nigeria is, is sort of colored by a high degree of uncertainty at the moment. You know that the, um, what happened in the banking industry, and going forward again, I mean, Nigeria is expecting elections. So I think mm. some of that um, intransigence or, or uh, uncertainty is, is a res as a result of that. Cote d'Ivoire um, has had its own electoral crisis. Mm. What we're seeing currently as we speak mm -hmm. seems to be a run on the banks, people wanting to withdraw mm -hmm. their deposits from banks, uh, those who could selling off some of their shares in the banks, the stock exchange suspended its activities. Do you think the industry can recover from this particular impasse? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd be very optimistic, I would hope, on the future of Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, I have to say that its infrastructure is, is excellent in terms of... Um, comparisons to the rest of West Africa. Mm. Abidjan, for example, has the most developed port uh, other than Cape Town on the west coast of, of Africa, if you like. Um, uh, some of the, the, far the banks in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire are owned by French banks, you mentioned, Société Générale, mm. uh, BNP Paribas, and so forth. So they've been there a long time. And I think it's important to remember that Cote d'Ivoire is the sort of fulcrum, economic fulcrum, of the eight countries in Francophone West Africa. So it's very unfortunate what's happened at the moment, but if they could just set that aside, I mean, I think there's huge potential. So you think this is just an aberration? It's I just something it's that's just happening a, I, at the moment? I hope it's just an aberration. And I mean, it's in, I, I said we sort of looked at different um, markets based on their economic development. Mm -hmm. Cote d'Ivoire could almost be seen to be the most diversified economy of all of the countries that we looked at. I mean, it has a third of the world's uh, cocoa yeah. exports, and it, it has palm oil, it has coffee. It's quite a diversified economy. So the fundamentals are strong there. Yeah. Let's talk about Ghana, because it's regarded as an economy in transition. But what we have seen is growth in Ghana has been driven by uh, the financial services sector yeah. and the growth of Ghanaian banks, together with the fact that Ghana has now become an oil and gas producer. Mm -hmm. What are the prospects for the banks there? Uh, Ghana looked good as well. Um, it has high interest rates and it's had quite high inflation relative to some of the other markets. Um, the largest bank in Ghana is the Ghana Commercial Bank, which is actually state-owned. Uh, Barclays Bank is there, Standard Chartered is there. I think Ghana's got lots of potential going forward. Um, th things that are an issue in a number of these different markets are credit bureaus and the effectiveness of credit bureaus or even the existence of a credit bureau. 
uh, land registry as well. If all of these things can fall into place. And what about things like exposure to bank credit? Because the banks tend to be uh, mopping up a lot of the government debt. Yeah, um, well, I agree on that, although it's, I mean, coming from North America and, and also looking at Europe. I mean, Africa looks so good compared to some of the experiences that have occurred in other, uh, as it were, developed markets. Mm -hmm. So um, I, th I think the, the future looks good in most of these markets. DRC regarded as an economy in pre-transition. Obviously, they're coming out of a protracted war, mm -hmm. uh, partitioning of the country and all sorts of other issues. But why is it taking so long to just get that economy I think it's, to recover? It's just such an early stage. I mean, I, I've often asked people this question, 71 million people in DRC, mm. how many bank accounts do you think there are? Yeah. It's, it's estimated between 350,000 and 500,000 bank accounts in a country of 71 million. There are 117 bank branches in the DRC. So it's just, it's got to be baby steps initially, and then once those steps occur, then we move on to something uh, do you, bigger. Do you get a sense that uh, authorities are taking very pronounced action by just way of reforming the banking sector, trying to support its development and growth? Uh, well, yes, and listening to people on the ground, I mean, there, there are a number of legislative innovations which seem close to reaching fruition, but haven't quite reached fruition. So I think if those occurred, um, Stepping outside the banking industry, uh, DRC has a nationalized insurance sector. Mm -hmm. So that one nice transgression would be if they were to privatize or, or, or re-privatize mm -hmm. uh, the insurance sector. So there, there are things like that. What I find in DRC was that a number of the banks like ProCredit and Advance Bank are basically supported by development right. agencies from Europe. Very briefly, Angola, we have a situation where it's now the second largest exporter of oil, but mm -hmm. the government has a very heavy hand with the state-owned oil company mm -hmm. also being a shareholder in some of the banks. Yeah, um, Banco Bay is the largest bank in Angola. Its uh, shareholder is Sonengol, and Sonengol, the state oil company, actually has shareholdings in four other banks in Angola. Um, the other major banks in Angola are basically Portuguese owned and of course Standard Bank has just opened uh, mm. uh, offices there. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, The Economist this week actually predicted that Angola might even pass Nigeria as the biggest oil exporter mm. on the continent.